Good evening, Sports Zonians. How's everybody doing out there tonight? I am Mike Gagley Laurel. I am your host for this is Sports Zone. Coming to you live and a little early tonight, like we do just about every week here via the I-95 Sports and Entertainment Radio Network. We got a good show for you tonight. No air trust like tonight. He is away on his honeymoon. But we do have Dave Hastings with us, and we are going to have a lot of stuff to talk about tonight. I got a couple of little baseball notes I would like to bring up tonight. Um, I know we're going to be talking some of the college basketball tournament that has been happening, maybe a little football news to break in there, too. Um, might even talk about the fact that, you know, we had, when, um, when talk of the, the startup football leagues had first came in last year, we heard about the XFL was going to start play in 2020, and then you had the American, or the, what was it, the Alliance? of American football, which, of course, began play after the Super Bowl. I think it was the week after the Super Bowl. And that looked like the league that could actually make the most headway because you had Charlie Ebersol fronting it. You had Bill Polian and a number of ex-football players and executives who were kind of the brains behind the whole thing. And it looked like that one may actually gain some traction. And – uh Apparently, their ultimate goal was to become a developmental league for the NFL, which I, I, I don't know if that's the best idea to be a long-ranging goal. I mean, I think the goal should be to be solvent on your own before you try to merge up with the NFL. And I think whenever you try to do something like that, you're kind of asking for some problems here. Um, God, I really hope that doesn't affect that. I think you're kind of asking for some problems with that. But uh, today it was announced that the AAF has already suspended play. We're not even a full season in, and they're already going belly up. And with that, we're going to bring Dave Hastings in tonight. Dave, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Mike. I'm doing good. How about yourself? Not too bad. Let me ask you about this because today is kind of going to be a random topics type of show. I have a lot of very random topics that I want to bring up and get your thoughts on. And because I feel like that's kind of been the way the week has gone. I mean, obviously got the NCAA tournament and I definitely want your thoughts on that. But other than that, I just feel like there's been a lot of random things that kind of popped up this week. And one of them, as I started to say before you came on, have, have did you get a chance to watch any of this Alliance of American Football, the AAF? Because apparently it's been on CBS and the CBS Sports Network uh, since its inception here. You see any of this? Uh, believe it or not, I've actually seen more of it on NFL Network, which I – That's <laughs> what it was. Surprising, but yeah. It was yeah. NFL Network, CBS. I watched mm – -hmm. look, I never watched the game from start to finish. That simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I never did that. And honestly, it's something that when I did watch, though, it was enjoyable. I mean, it, there's no other way for me to say it. Like, these guys, you know, it's not the NFL. I mean, some of the execution isn't really there and, you know, some other things that can be worked on. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's – there were some moments where you really saw some guys that, you know, given the right opportunity, maybe had a chance. Um, I find it hysterical that in the league, Trent Richardson led the league in rushing touchdowns, yet only averaged 2.9 yards per carry. Well, that's Trent Richardson. That is definitely a Trent Richardson line, I'll tell you that. And that's why I found it so amusing. I'm like, wow, Trent Richardson's still Trent Richardson. Good mm -hmm. for him. Um, but, you know, but, yeah, but all in all, I mean, there were some good plays. The biggest problem for them is the quarterback play. Mm. Without good quarterback play, you just don't have a product that is something you want to continuously watch, I guess mm. is the best way to say it. So, uh, But I think overall, the sense I'm getting from you is while it wasn't – it obviously wasn't on par with the NFL. It's something it – maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong on this. It's something that you feel like a couple of years down the road, this could actually be some pretty worthwhile football, though, right? 100%. And I think, you know, the more you put into it, the more training you're able to get these guys, the more 
time together. I mean, you got to keep in mind that for all in all, these teams were kind of thrown together. Yeah. And we're playing games in a matter of a year, year and a half. Mm-hmm. You know, and most of the guys that are playing are guys that never played together before. Yeah. So, I mean, and from what I read, they actually aren't going belly up. It's they yeah. feel like they're going to they, – they feel like they're better to cut their losses now than try to ride it out and really – lose you know even more yeah um, i mean the the wording they use was they're suspending play which uh, i think it, in the short term means that it, everything's done basically because if you look at how it went they were losing money early on so they took on this one investor who put 250 million dollars into it they had problems they had to move the training facility from one of their teams in florida to atlanta georgia uh, the championship game was supposed to be in Nevada. They were selling tickets for the arena that uh, UNLV uses, but apparently they never had a written agreement with UNLV, so they moved the championship game, and they had all these issues. And then last week, the guy who put $250 million in said, unless we get a partnership with the NFL, we're probably not going to be able to continue. And he's the guy who actually made the call to suspend operation because he already lost, like, 70 million, I think he said, on his investment or something like that. Yeah, that's what I read. It was the guy who put yeah. in 250, he's lost 70. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for him, it was a decision to really kind of, you know, f- see if there's a better way to approach this before keeping it going and letting more money get drained. Here's, so, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, keep going. I, I was just going to say, so I mean, I wouldn't say it's dead. Uh, Mm -hmm. But there's a good chance that it might be. And, you know, now it's looking like your only other option for a different league is going to be the XFL, which debuts next year. Yeah. And, um, I mean, we can talk about the XFL in a little while, but sticking with this real quick. One thing I had said before you came on the air, I want to know how you feel like this. It seems like their end goal was to become a developmental league for the NFL. And, to my way of thinking, yeah, that's not a bad idea, but to me, if that's your ultimate end game and not to create a sustainable league on your own, I, I, don't, I don't really see how you could survive if that's your ultimate goal, not league sustainability all by itself. Yeah, if you go into something with the goal of being second place, you're already losing. Yeah, yeah, right on. I, I totally agree with you on that. Um, so I, to me, I think that was one of their main problems and obviously some sort of planning here didn't really help. I mean, if you're selling tickets to a place that you want your na- your championship to be in, but you don't have a written agreement with the guys who actually own the place, that, that, that's, that's not exactly a good, um, foreboding situation right there. Number two. So I, I don't know. I'm kind of dis- I'm, I'm disappointed to see that this happens so soon. Because I thought all these leagues, like this one and the XFL, I thought they had a decent shot because it seemed like this was the right time to try to capitalize. Because, I mean, we talked about it when these leagues started. A lot of animosity towards the NFL. A lot of things they haven't exactly been doing right over the last few years. And it seemed like if a team or if a league really put some time and effort into player development and putting a decent, halfway decent product on the field, they could kind of siphon off some of everybody's love for football. So to see this one go belly up, not even one season through, it's a little disappointing. Yeah, I, I was definitely – when I read it, I was disappointed. But, you know, I, I, they kind of still leave that small little glimmer of hope that it might not be over. But bottom mm-hmm. line is when your biggest money backer is the guy saying that, you know, I, I don't think we should keep going on this until we have a better, you know – set up, you know, especially when it comes down to a relationship with the NFL, you know, and then, you know, you got a problem. And that's the big issue with, with football compared to other sports and trying to have a developmental league. It's mm-hmm. such a physically demanding game and the beating that you take playing that game, it, it's not something where you could draft a guy and say, hey, you know what, let's put him in the developmental league, develop, <laughs> developmental hey. league you know, for two seasons to get them a little bit more prepared and then bring them in Mm -hmm. because you never know. In those two seasons, he could have a career-ending injury. He could have an injury that lingers for the remainder of his career, and this guy never got his chance to even earn a big payday. And that's kind of, you know, that's really where 
you know, they kind of have – being a developmental league is kind of a hard shot. I think what they were hoping for is that one or two guys were going to have such a good season – that the NFL brought them into a training camp and then they made it out of training camp and made the roster. And like, I think they were hoping to be able to have a guy that wasn't actually developed, you know, not, I wouldn't say per se developed in their league, Mm -hmm. but have a guy, you know, that they can present as look what this league can lead to for other players. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. I also think another issue is, I mean, obviously, you need someone who's going to be the money guy uh, on the on the the ones on the business end of it. But I think the problem is it was started by guys like Charlie Ebersole, um, who kind of wanted to do right where his father and the XFL did wrong. And then you got great guys like Bill Polian, who you know his NFL background. They have a love of the game, and then you kind of turn control of the league over to a guy who maybe doesn't have that love of the game and always sees the dollars and cents sign of it. And the second it looks like things are going bad, he bails on it. And I think that that's a big problem. And I think the one thing the XFL will have going for it in that case is you have a guy like Vince McMahon. Maybe he doesn't have the love of the game the way that, you know, a Bill Pony does or anything like that. But this is a guy who's worked in sports entertainment his whole life for him. He's more open to taking a loss for a future success than other people in that situation would. And I think that's that's one of the things I think the XFL, uh, XFL will have going for it when it starts next year, in addition to the fact that they will have had two years to put everything together. And I think they saw what happens when you rush a product out in six months and don't really look at the player development side. And it, I would like to think they will get that side right this time around. Yeah, I mean, I think they have the potential. And like you said, I mean, Vince McMahon is, is a billionaire, like mm-hmm. a multi-billionaire. So he has millions of dollars he can lose and be able to ride the, the wave until it turns into something more profitable. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, I mean, it's definitely something where it, it'll it's obviously a different financial setup. Um, you know, for the most part, it's not like he's really going into this with, you know, partners, you know, it's a little bit more of a WWE type of thing, um, which well, is basically Vince McMahon. Well, actually, that's not entirely accurate because what he did when he started this, he actually sold a bunch of B and C level shares uh, of stock that he held in the WWE a way to uh, – gain $100 million in capital to start this league. He's actually doing this league completely separate from the WWE. He's not he's not bringing the WWE into this like he did with the XFL, which I think was a smart thing for him to do. Oh, no, I meant his money, not not uh, actually. Uh, like, yeah, like I don't expect him to have wrestlers showing up and, you know, singing national anthems or anything like that. But. Well, they, they kind of did something like that the first go around, and it didn't really work out too well. You had Jesse Ventura do a play-by-play. Yeah, see, that's <laughs> what I mean. You, you want to have football guys doing football things. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. And, I mean, you know, there's a little th- – you know, we still got some time until they come around and really put their stuff on the field and show you their product and – We'll see what that turns into, but you know, it, I think they have a they have more potential due to the fact that it really is something that he can swallow the pill of you know having a rough first season and still push for a second. Um, yeah. So I, yeah, I, yeah. he's got that going for him. Absolutely, absolutely. As long as he can get something in terms of distribution going for him, which. He may have something because he signed a lucrative deal for SmackDown to appear on Fox. So, I mean, well, Lord only knows what's happening with that. Well, the, the, the actual Fox movie studio may have been sold to Disney, but the actual Fox network stays with uh, the Murdochs and all that, and they keep Fox News and all that. So we'll see what comes of that. So well, that, really, really quick, since Vince McMahon is, you know, somebody we're talking about. I, I, re- I, I really hope you're going where I wanted to go next. Please tell me you're going where I wanted to go next. Please go ahead. So I was going to go with the episode of last week tonight. With That's Tom exactly Oliver. where I wanted to go next. Yes, thank you, Dave. Go right ahead. Uh, 
Okay. So, I mean, I don't know, you know, what your game plan on was, you know, with going for it, but, you know, knowing the, you know, love you have for wrestling, um, especially, you know, in your younger days more than perhaps today, but, yeah, you know, it was something that like, I mean, we've sat here, me, you and Eric have talked about it and you guys obviously have a much greater knowledge than I do. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's something that, yeah, I enjoyed as a kid, but never really got fully into, you know, watching that special, that he did and that breakdown of what he did and seeing some of the, you know, the one clip of Vince McMahon in the interview when the guy asked him about, you know, what's his thoughts on, you know, these wrestlers that die at such a young age and he gets so defensive that he literally slaps the paper, tries to slap the papers out of the reporter's hands. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, the fact that these guys are registered as 1099 employees, like, and, you know, don't get the support that, what they really deserve based on what their bodies go through. Um, you know, I really found uh, amazing because I mean, doing the job I do, you know, I work for a payroll company and I know the difference between 1099s and W2s and the benefits of doing each one. And one of the top benefits of being a 1099 employee is you get to work when you want to and not work when you don't want to. Yeah. So, you know, the fact they're listed as 1099s and the IRS is literally like turning a blind eye to this is mind blowing to me. And it, it, made, it gave me a different perspective because to me, it was, I didn't know that they had the conditions that they have. I thought they got it a lot better. And I understood, you know, you know, for every rock there's, you know, rock Johnson, there's 500 guys that never come even close to that level of superstardom, whether it's wrestling or turning over to acting. Um, you know, so I was aware of the fact that it was lopsided like that, but I didn't realize how, how dramatic of a situation that these guys who really entertain hundreds of millions of people around the world year round, the way they get treated and the setup that they have, it was mind blowing to me and it made me really feel Heart, almost heartbroken for what these guys get put through for what they get in return. Yeah, um, I mean, I got to be honest. The way I was going to bring it up was I was actually going to ask your thoughts on it because, like you said, uh, I'm not as big of a wrestling fan as I used to be in my late teens and early 20s. I do still follow it from time to time. Very much looking forward to seeing uh, they have an all-female main event at WrestleMania. It's the first all-female main event in history. And the, the Monday Night Raw that they had last night leading up to it, it was just the craziest thing I've seen on WWE in over 20 years. It was awesome. But uh, to me, I got to be honest, I love John Oliver. You know, I'm not as, I, I don't watch him as much as I used to, but he does stuff like this all the time, and I think he's one of the best late-night hosts there is. And the way he does these packages, the way he does is amazing. And anybody who doesn't watch him needs to be watching him because he does some great stuff. There's not one thing that he put in that show last night that was a new that was a new concept to me. I've known about the fact that wrestlers are independent contractors uh, for years. Anyone who follows wrestling really knows that. And he did leave some things out. Like one of the main reasons why WWE is able to get away with stuff like this, this at least in the industry is because they kind of are the industry right now, and they've basically been the wrestling industry since about 2001 when WCW went out of business. There's a few other wrestling promotions around, but if you want to be in the major leagues, WWE is the only place you can really go for that. So that's one of the main reasons they get away uh, with it. Uh, one, another thing he left out, a lot of the conditions that he described he didn't shy away from anything, and he's not wrong with anything he says. A lot of things have gotten better in terms of health care for the wrestlers um, and the wellness program and all that stuff. Since Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit died uh, back in the mid-2000s, Chris Benoit murdered suicide and everything. The fact that he killed his wife and his son, and then he killed himself, and he was a major steroid user, and it was a bit of a bright rage and all that stuff. That really kind of woke them up to the fact that, hey, we need to do something here because we're going to be held liable for this shit one way or another. So they've gotten a lot better in terms of providing rehab services for their wrestlers and trying to take care of 
their um, uh, retired wrestlers. Like, I know they showed the thing with Jake the Snake uh, needing to fund an Indiegogo program to get a surgery he needed. The one thing they didn't show is they had spent millions of dollars on drug rehab and alcohol rehab for their former wrestlers. Uh, Roberts being one of them, Scott Hall, who you may remember as Razor Ramon from the mid nineties was yep. another one. Yep. Uh, he, they paid for rehab for him countless times. Uh, Sean Waldman, otherwise known as the one, two, three kid in the mid nineties. He was another one they paid for rehab. For him on. So they have, they, they have taken, they have tried to, but in the end, he wasn't wrong with a lot of they said, a lot of what he said. They don't provide the type of health care that most jobs provide their employees, you know, if you get sick or stuff like that. Wrestlers, I, like um, in the CM Punk uh, quote that he had put up there, the audio clip that he put up, wrestlers are under pressure to perform through a bunch of different uh, injuries because if they don't perform, they don't get paid. You know, things are a lot different than they were in the 90s in terms of guaranteed contracts and things like that. But it still co does come down to if you're hurt and you're missing the uh, amount of time, you're probably going to lose your spot on the roster. You're probably going to lose a lot of money that comes with it. Uh, the idea that wrestlers are all multi-million dollar paid out athletes, there are a handful of wrestlers who make multi-million dollar contracts. And like you said, for every Rock, for every Stone Cold Steve Austin, there are hundreds of wrestlers who were 365 days a year and don't make one-fifth of what they probably should make for all that time spent on the road because they don't get reimbursed for gas mileage or tolls or rent cars or anything like that. So Because yeah. they're 1099 employees. Exactly. That's, that's the biggest problem to me. Mm -hmm. You tell them that they if they can't work, they can't get paid, which is basically one of the rules of a 1099 employee. I, I, you don't work, you don't get I paid. Will, I will say this, just so you know. That rule is not – like, they do get paid something for time mixed, mixed, but it's not as much because back in the 80s and 90s, it was a lot worse. The one thing that WCW did was start the idea of guaranteed contracts, and as a result of that, WWE kind of had to switch to guaranteed contracts in order to survive. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Well, yeah, but like you said, how many of those are out there now? Mm. You know, yeah. and it, it's just, I mean, watching that, like I said, it was kind of an eye opener. I didn't realize they were in that bad of a situation because, like I said, I mean, when you really look at it and you really think about it, I mean, it, the, it blows my mind that the IRS lets them get away with it. There's no other way for me to say it. I, that, that, I, that I totally agree with you on. I mean, and it I, is literally a multi billion dollar industry. Mm hmm. And they let, and that is part of the reason why mm -hmm. they were treated as W two employees. If they got injured, they're covered under workman's compensation. If they get severely injur injured, they get short term disability. It, you know what I mean? Like, it, <laughs> when you re and I mean some of the things that they, you know, he pointed out that's in their contracts, and I, I mean. It was definitely an eye opener. I mean, the Jake the Snake thing was almost freaking heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, well, the you know, pipe, but the I, pipe. bottom line is, I loved his message at the end. Mm -hmm. The point of the matter is, and the one, the one group that has power with the WWE, and it's been proven time and time again, is the fans. Yeah, that's so I not. Loved his, I loved his message at the end about you know they're you they're the ones that can change this, and when. You love these wrestlers so much. You're willing to contribute to a GoFundMe for surgery. That shows you how much you care about these wrestlers. Uh, obviously, the ones you really like more than anything mm -hmm. else. But still, it, it, it's a group thing. It's, it amazes me that, you know, uh, he was able to stop them from uh, – Vince McMahon was able to stop them from union, unionizing. Uh, I mean, it, oh, it's you know the story behind that? I, 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 I had heard this years past. Here's a story behind that. So Jesse Ventura tried to unionize wrestlers in '86, '87. Like you said, Vince McMahon stopped them. He stopped them because Hulk Hogan ran in them out to Vince McMahon. And when McMahon was on trial with the federal federal government, 
He flipped on Hulk Hogan while he was under oath. The, uh, the, apparently, the government guy said, yeah, you'd stop them from trying to unionize it. Yeah, Hogan told me about it. And that's why everybody hated Hogan, like wrestlers hated Hogan through the mid-90s. And that makes sense to me. They should. He, yeah. I mean, I didn't know that, and it's kind of sad to hear, considering when you look at Hulk Hogan, he's one of the few guys that were lucky enough to turn into a successful person because of wrestling. And that's why he ratted him out, because he didn't, he didn't need to be unionized at that point. Yeah, so it meant nothing to him, so he screwed over everybody else. That, that's mm-hmm. I, that that's really sad because I always loved Hogan and I didn't. Well, there's a, there's a lot of things about Hulk Hogan where if you know stuff about the late '90s and why WCW went under, part of the reason why WCW went under was because they could never push their younger stars, and part of the reason was they had so many veterans on the roster like Hulk Hogan who did not want to give up their spot and get out of that main event spot that they didn't want to put anybody over. So when they finally started putting over the younger talent, it was too late. They were they had already started to go belly up. Wow. Yeah, Hogan's Hogan's not a good Hogan is not a good guy. Like honestly, I respect everything he did for the business. Uh, when I grew up as a wrestling fan, it was I started watching wrestling in 93 after Hogan left the WWE. So I don't look at Hogan the same way that people who grew up watching wrestling in the 80s and early 90s do. I don't. Yeah, and see, I, I mean, I, I remember, you know, the, the yellow and red Hogan yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. when I was a kid. And then I remember the NWO Hogan, you mm-hmm. know. But, yeah, it, it's – that that's crazy, man. I I did not know all this stuff about wrestling, and it, it kind of it, it's a little disappointing. I do mm-hmm. agree. I think it's awesome that they got their first female main event coming up this Sunday. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and the fact that they have somebody like Ronda Rousey as as a headliner, real, I mean, obviously helps them. Well, um, I'll say this: Rousey's great and everything. The other two women in the main event, Charlotte Flair, who is Ric Flair's daughter, and Becky Lynch. They are two of the ones who have put that women's wrestling division on their back for the last three or four years. And those are the two who deserve the spotlight. Like, honestly, if the main event was just the two of them, it would be one of the best matches you've ever seen. The fact that it's the three of them, looking forward to it. Yes. Yes. I, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad that you saw it, too. I wasn't sure if you did. So, nah, you were you were the one I was going to be like, tell me you saw this. So that's awesome that you're the one who yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a big uh, – if John Oliver's show was on every night of the week, I'd watch it. Mm-hmm. But I think one of the great things about the fact that he's only on once a week is that him and his writing team get the time to put together these wonderful pieces. Like I, the net neutrality one, the first one he did was awesome. Freaking crashed the FCC server with everybody writing in, uh, stop the laws limiting net neutrality. The fact that he started his own religion – on the show, you see that one where he started his own religion. That one, I that one's a good one. The uh, Supreme Court of Dogs. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that was good. I mean, I think <laughs> one of my favorite ones was the uh, pandas that like direct traffic or something like that. That was hysterical. Um, no, nah, I I think you're right. I mean, they really do a great job. They put mm-hmm. some really good pieces together and. What I like is, you know, he does his, you know, jokes about Trump and the country and all that. But he then, you know, talks to you about something that you might not even have thought to be concerned about or interested in. When he did the robocalls with the FCC. Oh, I saw that one. That was that, great. That, that was great. Because, I mean, I don't know about you. I get probably like 10 of those a week. Oh, yeah. I, I, a day. A fucking day. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I thought that was kind of awesome. Um, but, yeah, big fan of John Oliver and the uh, – uh, last week's night show. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we we could probably talk about this topic freaking all night, but I think we should move on. It was fun to talk about that one for a little bit. I want to bring up a couple baseball things with you real quick. Not necessarily about the the first week of uh, of baseball being back in. Did you hear this thing? Because this this story I had to bring up on the show a little bit because this this was a little nauseating to hear about the. The topic is basically re- referred to as the arbitration belt. Have you heard about this? I have not. Okay. So 
apparently the owners have been giving out a salary arbitration belt to the owner whose team is able to keep salaries the lowest. I don't know if you're familiar with the salary arbitration process, but basically every, every player who comes up, minor, uh, minor leaguers promoted to the, the major, is under team control for about six years. The first two years, you get the regular minimum salary. Then you get four years of salary arbitration, where basically you and the team negotiate a salary on a year-to-year basis. Um, we've seen a number of players get extensions from their teams in the last few weeks. The latest ones, Xavier Fogarts just signed a six-year, $120 million extension a couple days ago. Ronald Acuna from the Atlanta Braves just signed an eight-year, $100 million exception, uh, um, extension today, uh, buying out his arbitration years. And the players have been accusing the league of collusion amongst the owners the last couple of years, given the way that it seems like a lot of the mid-level players can't really get contracts until later of the season. But the Athletic reported that the league hands out an actual championship belt every year to the team that did its best to keep salaries at their lowest in arbitration. And the league acknowledged the existence of the belt, calling it an informal recognition of those clubs' salary arbitration departments that did the best. Now, Dave, the league's collective bargaining agreement with the players is up in two years. And this right here might be the thing that causes a work stoppage in 2021. What, well, what do yeah, you I mean, that almost sounds like a broad definition of co- collusion. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're basically saying, hey, we are going to reward the team that is a be- be- most capable of shafting the players. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know if there's another way to say it other than that. Like, hey, you did the greatest job of shafting the, you know, 20 or so guys on your roster. So you got a championship belt for being able to do that. I mean, that's <laughs> – that's kind of absurd, and yeah, if I was a player and found this out, I'd be re- like, if I'm head of the players' union in the MLB, oh man, is that not at the top of my list of things I'm bringing up when we sit down for negotiations? Well, he already kind of brought it up because the head of the union, Tony Clark, his statement was that clubs make sport of trying to suppress salaries in a process designed to produce fair settlements shows a blatant lack of respect for our players, the game, and the arbitration process itself. I mean, I hear this, and, you know, it's, it's weird to me, because the last couple of years, me and Eric have kind of talked about the fact that we kind of thought the owners were getting smarter because for years, you had seen guys in, you know, their early, mid-30s pulling down these three- and four-year contracts for $40, 50000000 million that never really panned out. It always seemed... And I've, I've said this both to you a few times. It always kind of seemed like free agency was the owners paying for past performance as opposed to the future. And it just kind of seemed like there was a market correction going on here. Like the, the owners were just getting smarter. And then you hear something like this, and it's just absolutely ridiculous. And I, I don't know what idiot started this and who thought this was a good idea. But when the, if the players really do wind up striking in 2021, the owners got no one to blame for this but themselves. Because every time it looks like, you know, they may actually come together and get things right, you have something like this. And I don't really know if there's going to be any coming back from this one. This one is just horrible. Yeah, it's it, that that's um, that's not a good good way to go into the final two years of your. Uh your collective bargaining agreement before negotiations get started. That's for damn sure. I mean, honestly, when you really look at it, the, the league that the players have at the best is the NBA. Yes. Um, you know, Adam Silver's done a great job of maintaining relations with the players union. Their collective bargaining agreement was due to uh, come to an end like a year in like a year or two. They've already basically finalized the new collective bargaining agreement from the last thing I heard. Mm. Um, you know, so, I mean, that's, that, that to me is your example. Um, 
and it, yeah, I think that's that's sad. I mean, especially being a guy that's not overly into baseball. Uh, bottom line is these guys play from uh, what is it, April till uh, October, almost early November. If you bring spring training into it, they start in February. They start the games at the beginning of March, and then yeah, they go into October and sometimes November. So yeah, you're talking almost ten months a year they're playing. Mm-hmm. And that. That's not cool, man. There's no other way for me to say it. that's not cool mm-hmm. to be out to to basically agree as a league, have thirty owners say, "All right, let's have a competition to see who can lowball the players on their team the best." That that's that's a damn shame. There's no yeah. other way to put it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, hopefully next week or at some point we can get Eric's perspective on this one. But I think that's really all that needs to be said on it right now. Uh, I have one other minor baseball thing to bring up, and then we can move on. If you have something you'd like to bring up, you want to talk uh, a little bit about uh, baseball games from this weekend, you can feel free. Um, I want to bring up something we had talked about a couple weeks ago, the rule changes uh, from baseball, and uh, specifically the one that I was against and you guys were for, um, the idea of you bring a pitcher into a game in the middle of the inning, and he has to – uh, pitch to three batters. I know you guys were in favor of it because it'll speed the game up. Uh, I want to. This is real quick. We don't have to say on this too long. I want to kind of reproach you on that because I don't think it's going to speed the game up initially. Now, your th- what you said about strategies change and teams will adjust and players will adjust. I think that'll prove true two or three years down the road when this rule takes place. But I think that first year, and watching some of the things that have happened this weekend in baseball, I think next year games are going to go on even longer than they have been as a result of this rule. The reason why I feel this way is because you bring in a guy who's normally used to facing a certain certain type of batter, and you require him to go out of his comfort zone and face guys he's never had to face before and situations he's never been in before. And you can't take him out until he's faced three batters. What will wind up happening, like I said, at least in that first year, you're going to see a lot of guys getting into trouble, maybe allow two, three base runners, so a guy has to come in to clean up his mess with three guys on, and it'll leach much bigger innings, at least right off the bat, I think. And I think that first year, I wouldn't be surprised if the games expand five, ten minutes longer than anybody really thought they would. And then maybe the second or third year when guys have a chance to really settle in, it'll go down. But that first year, no way those games are going to be shorter. Uh, look, you may, you may be right on that fact, but the other counterpoint or double part of the double-edged sword of what you're saying is, what's every league trying to push for? I don't care if it's NFL, NBA, NHL, MLB, soccer. God, I don't care what league you push at or look at. They're all pushing for offensive production. Mm. So all of a sudden you take an average fan, you know, a below average fan like myself, and maybe I turn into an average fan because they're scoring more runs per game. Yeah. And there's more, you know, there's more entertainment to it. I and then all of a sudden, you know, maybe at, like you said, the adjustments made in two, three years after. And by that point, now you got a guy like myself who maybe gets hooked, really hooked into watching and wanting to see that kind of stuff. So, I, I get your point, but it is kind of a double-edged sword when you think about it because more runs means more average people are going to be interested in watching, you know, team score. So, Matt, I will, my counterpoint, my final counterpoint, yes, offensive production is great for the sport, makes things exciting. Not if all those runs score via uh, three or four walks in it. I can tell you that right now. If you've ever seen a game where the majority of the runs come off of walks, <laughs> It's not quite as exciting. <laughs> yeah, I won't argue with that. That's an answer. I'd, I'd be shutting off the table, uh, the TV after the first walk. Yeah, oh, but you got seven runs scored. You have any walks? Fifteen people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now that wouldn't go over very well. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just had to bring that up because, like I said, tonight's one of those nights. It just seems like a lot of random things have happened. We'll talk about, and I just wanted to bring it up real quick. So. Dave, you want to talk uh, a little college basketball? You watch the games this weekend? Uh, yeah, man. I watched North Carolina lose to Auburn. Auburn <laughs> just couldn't miss anything. I mean, once I watched the guy hit a 
a bank shot three pointer. I'm like, yeah, this game is over. Mm. Um, so my bracket got completely washed with North Carolina getting eliminated in the Sweet 16 and Duke going out in the Elite Eight. Um, so that that was my national championship game. So my bracket's completely washed. Oh, you had Duke, uh, North Carolina. Wow, you had a classic. Oh, I was hoping for it too because I'm such a I'm such a UNC fan. So I was really hoping for it. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, but I think what's interesting is when you look at the Final Four. Michigan State is the only team that's ever been there before or an only coach that's ever been there. And it, Tom Izzo has been there now. This will be his eighth Final Four appearance with Michigan State. Um, you know, it, 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 it'll be an opportunity for you to see how much experience really matters going through the Final Four several times compared to guys that have never coached there before and teams that have really never been there before. Mm. So I think that that to me is a really interesting, uh, you know, part of the final four that you're looking at. Um, But, yeah, you have a bunch of, you know, Virginia is a team that made it there. And last year they were only the second number one seed to ever be eliminated by a 16 seed. Uh, They were the Um, first. They were the first. Oh, they were right They were. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was uh, two seeds being eliminated by 15. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So you have that, which to me is – uh, that that's kind of crazy to think about. And then, you know, I think the biggest storyline that comes out of the weekend before you go into the Final Four is you look at a team like Duke, who's been the favorite all year long. They've been, you know, have the best, you know, the number one and number two, maybe number one and number three overall picks in the NBA draft on their team. Um, you know, the, those things to me are really interesting because the teams that are in there have, much more veteran laden rosters with juniors and seniors and even sophomores on their roster. So Mm -hmm. I, I, it's, to me, it's been the continuous ultimate question for college basketball. Are you better off getting, you know, three five-star recruits that are one and done, or are you better off getting some three and four star recruits that are going to play three or four years for you and really help you develop a real chemistry as a team? Um, you know, and I think it's always – it's a nonstop argument because you've seen teams win both ways. But more often than not, it's the teams with the veterans that really are going, you know, too deep, going deeper into the tournament than the teams with the young kids that have never been there before and never had the experience of playing there. So, uh, I think that's your biggest question mark going into the Final Four from the week games that you saw this past weekend. I think CBS is unbelievably disappointed with the Final Four that they got. Um, Michigan State would be your biggest name in that in the Final Four, and they're not, you know, the biggest school in the you know the nation when it comes down to fans and followers. Mm. You know, compared to your UNCs and your Dukes and your you know Gonzagas. And, you know, these teams that really have a huge following, not just with the kid, people that went to the school, but, you know, with the actual fans of just college basketball. You know, I never t- stepped foot on, you know, Chapel Hill's campus, and I'm a huge Tar Heel fan. So, but I also don't root for the Tar Heels when it comes to college football. You know, I just like them in college basketball. So, you know, you're running the risk of losing – fans such as myself now obviously I'm going to watch the games I'm a big basketball fan so I'm still gonna watch them but instead of maybe watching it from tip off to the final buzzard I might not tune in until after the uh you know first half is done Mm so you know it's one of those things where you really it's a it's a high risk high reward moment for CBS because you can still pull those players you know those fans but you need the games to be good, and if they're not, you're going to have a lot of people shutting it off real quickly. Yeah, I agree with that. It also seems like there's no real star power on any of these teams. Like, you, you heard the big names like John Moran on, uh, on Murray State, the, the guys on Duke and all that. No real superstar players on any of these teams, if I'm correct, right? Not really, no. I mean, you got some guy, you got some guys on Michigan State that have played for a couple of years that people might know of, but for the most part, no. 
Mm. It's really, it, it's really a, a bunch of, you know, kids that basically you'll never see step foot on a basketball court once they're done with college. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I think it's by the looks of it, I think it's one that diehard college basketball fans will really like, but it doesn't seem to have a lot of that crossover appeal to get the casual fans in or anything like that. So I do agree with you on that one. Let me ask you something though. The, the, the Duke game coming out of that, I've, I've heard some things. Do you think guys like Zion Williamson and uh, RJ Barrett, do you think they get a, take a hit in terms of their NBA stock from that, from that game, that loss? Not a single one. Really? Not a single one. I mean – because R.J. Barrett uh, took a lot of criticism after that loss. I've heard a lot of criticism against that. Yeah, but the, the biggest criticism that really came out of that game was the fact that R.J. Barrett was the guy with the ball in his hands at the end of the game and not Zion Williamson more than anything else. Um, <laughs> but uh, they don't take a hit, and the bottom line is because NBA teams are looking at your upside and your potential, not really what you did in college which is why the why a lot of teams are starting to agree with the idea of eliminating the minimum uh, one year of college, one year before you can play. Um, so I, I, I don't think it'll have any effect on their draft stock at all. And I think it's what Zion, what, what Zion Williamson did this uh, tournament has only been done by one other player and that's Derek Rose. And Bottom line is, we all know if Derrick Rose was able to stay healthy, he'd be having a Hall of Fame career. Mm. You know, you get Rookie of the Year and uh, NBA MVP in your first three years in the league, and then all of a sudden you get your injury problems, and obviously you know what happens. But I think Derrick Rose, if he stays healthy his whole career, is arguably one of the best players or best point guards to ever play the game. Uh, I think he had that kind of potential if he continued to develop and go on the upside. but. You suffer an injury at 24, 25 years old, and your prime years in the NBA is really, you know, 25 to, you know, 30, you know. So he got hurt right before he could really get into his prime. And I, I think Zion Williamson has every bit of upside you could ever ask for in an NBA college uh, or a college player coming into the league. Mm. I, mean, I think if he came into the league as, a, as an 18-year-old, I'd say he, by the end of the season, he'd already be top 25, top 30 players in the whole league. See, that's interesting. Just based on everything I've heard about him, I, I don't know if he's going to have that impact in his first season. I really don't because he, he doesn't have an outside shot from everything I've heard of him. He seems like he'll be a little small to really go up against your power forwards or anything like that. Uh, and, and I don't know if he's a wing player just because he doesn't have the outside shot. I just – I don't know where he's going to fit in in the NBA based on everything I've heard. Well, put it this way. I mean, his body frame – let's see here. Hold on. I'm trying to – six mm -hmm. seven two eighty four. So he's basically a, an inch, inch or two shorter than LeBron but has him by like 25 pounds. And he's – a freak of an athlete. So, mm. I, I mean, look, the, the he, is he the passer and ball handler that LeBron is or even was just coming into the league? No. But does he have the potential to kind of get to that level 100% and offensively? He's going to be a monster. He has a great um, – he does an inside – he's lefty. So, he has this great inside step with his right with a powerful spin move where he ends up being able to finish with his left that is damn near impossible to guard. Mm. So, I, I mean, he, he's got all the potential in the, in, the, in the world, and I think that, you know, if, you, like, if you're a Knicks fan, you're praying you're able to get him because uh, you're, you will not be disappointed, and he's a great kid too. Mm. I mean, he is literally, from everything I've read about him, as an actual human being, he is a great kid. Okay. Okay. Well, I tell you, I tell you what. Um, unless you have anything else you'd like to add about college basketball, what you just said, 
makes me want to pivot to something else real quick. So do you have anything else about college basketball you'd like to throw in? I would just tell anybody, be willing to give the Final Four a shot because when it's all said and done, you're watching a bunch of young kids playing for something they've dreamed of for all their life, and they're going to give it everything they got. So even if you're doubtful on the teams that are playing in it, it's well worth giving them a shot to watch. Fair enough. Fair enough. So you brought up the Knicks. He may not be on the Knicks anymore, but we've heard an awful lot about Chris Stapp's Porzingis opening on this weekend, and really none of it good. Because apparently there's been this girl who came forward, hasn't pressed charges or anything, but apparently she has an allegation against uh, Porzingis that he physically assaulted her and raped her uh, February of last year. The Knicks apparently knew about this whole deal when they traded him to the Mavericks. Apparently the league was aware of it um, because I guess uh, there had been some agreement that the girl says that Chris Stapp had made with her uh, to pay her $68,000. Uh, that particular thing has been described as an extortion attempt. Like I said, the league was made aware of it. The Mavericks knew that there was an extortion attempt against them when they traded for him, but apparently they were not aware of the full rape allegations until after the trade was made. So what was your uh, reaction when you heard about this whole thing? Well, the interesting part to me is why would you go forward to a team and his agent and a player with an allegation before you go to the cops? Oh, did you see her letter to the Knicks? Yeah. Yeah. It's a big question mark to me. Yeah. It basically looks like you're looking for a payday. Mm. Now, we've gone over this, God, more times than I ever wished in my entire life to have to discuss this. But we all agree nobody's going to argue. If he did it, he deserves the fullest punishment to the extent of the law. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. He deserves to be punished. He deserves to be face every penalty possible because you don't treat not only a woman but a human being like that. Mm. But yeah. if this chick's just looking for a payday and trying to take advantage of some young kid who's making money, then, sh then screw her. You know what I mean? And, and the fact – out of all the times we've ever talked about this, the one thing we've never been able to say is that they went to the team and the player first before they went to the authorities. So that's a twist I'm not used to. That's a twist I don't know what to do about. And it makes me really kind of question the entire situation as a whole. So, I mean, either way, it's, it's a sad story if it's true. And it's a sad story if it's not true because this girl's just trying to extort this kid for money. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely um, the way it looks as of right now. Uh, I agree with you on that. The fact that the, the NBA Players Association, Michelle Roberts, the head of the NBA Players Association, released a statement saying they stand by Porzingis based on everything. I mean, I'll tell you this. I mean, like you said at the beginning, if he did what this woman is claiming, it's no wonder that the Knicks as an organization totally soured on this guy and wanted to get rid of him. It's no wonder on that one. Like, we always thought it was just a matter of the relationship between Porzingis and the Knicks front office. I can definitely see why they soured on him and wanted him out just for getting involved in something like this. But the woman herself, like you said, I don't know about the credibility because the supposedly signed agreement that she had with him. Apparently his name was spelled wrong, uh, spelled Chris Stapp, no S on it. They wanted to try to verify it with hand, handwriting experts and things like that. But she didn't want to give them the, the signed agreement. Um, and there were different things like in the email that we were talking about to the Knicks. I don't want to go to the authorities because I'm such a Knicks fan. Okay. All right, yeah. that, 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 that's really that, – that, that's a reason to keep yeah, this – Yeah, because thing. something like this is going to ruin the Knicks after, you know, 50 years of losing. Well, it hasn't been 50. Slow down there. It's only been 20. It's only been 20. Don't throw another 30 on there. 
We had the 90s. We had the 90s. I know you guys ruined it with Michael Jordan and everything, but we had the 90s. Well, yeah, you were good and relevant. And really quick, got to tell you an awesome, awesome story. Speaking of the 90s Knicks and Mr. Patrick Ewing. The man. So one of the one of the beat writers that I follow on Twitter, I can't remember his name right now, um, but he re- used to write for the New York Times, and he was the beat writer for the New York Knicks for the New York Times. Okay. So he told a story on – yeah, he posted this story uh, thread on Twitter yesterday about an April Fool's memory with Patrick Ewing. So he's – it's the end of the game. He goes up to – interview Patrick after the game. I guess he had a good game or something like that. Or, you know, it's his job, really. So Mm. he goes interview Patrick, and Patrick tells him, you know, he starts talking to him, but basically was trying to say, hey, you know, I'll get you in the locker room. Like, uh, I want to get back there. But while Patrick Ewing and him are are having this conversation, this very attractive uh, cheerleader for the New York Knicks runs up to the reporter and says, oh, my God, are you so-and-so? I read everything you write. I love your writing. Uh, can I buy you a drink after, you know, when you, after everybody's done tonight? You know, like, whole thing. So, obviously, you know, this guy's on freaking cloud nine. Like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Yeah. So, while the girl's talking to him, Patrick Ewing walks away and goes back to the locker room. The guy walks up to Patrick Ewing's locker locker. And Patrick and the cheerleader is actually right there. And he taps the cheerleader on the shoulder and says, hi, hey, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to meet you at, you know, this time. The cheerleader looks at him, acts like she doesn't even know him and kind of shrugs him off and walks away. Patrick Ewing turns and looks at him and just says, April Fool's. Oh, I thought you were going to say it was like Ewing's wife or something like that. Wow, that's no, so- no. I mean, come on, this guy should, would know who Patrick <laughs> Ewing's wife is. Um, but I mean, come on, Ewing took the time to go up to one of the cheerleaders, ask her to be flirtatious as hell with this beat writer, <laughs> and then to be at his locker when he walked up so that she could blow him off and act like she has no idea who he is, just so Ewing could bust his chops. That's crazy. Uh, I just thought that was a great story because I've always liked, you know, I always like Patrick Ewing. I mean, it helps that when I was rooting against him every time but one, we beat him. So it made life a lot easier. But, Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. A lot of hey, no problem. I, I don't mind Matt bringing that up too real quick. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I just thought that was a great story. It just shows you the kind of guy Patrick Ewing was and. You know, compared to the disappointment I find out about Hulk Hogan earlier with you, at least I, you know, find this out about a guy that, you know, I thought was a really great NBA player and I enjoyed watching him when I was a kid. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I love Patrick Ewing. That's my all-time favorite NBA player. without question, man. Absolutely. All right. I tell you what, let's move on from all this. because We're going to wrap up here in a few minutes, I think. Um, staying with April Fool's and transitioning into stuff we like, as opposed to that dreary subject that we were talking about a couple minutes ago. Did you see the clip from Jimmy Fallon show, the April Fool's joke that Maisie Williams, a.k.a. Ari Stark, had? I did, and when I first freaking watched it on, an, on Twitter, I was heartbroken and got sucked into it completely. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm with you on that to the point where you can you can quote me. Uh, I don't think it was an April Fool's joke. I think it's going to happen. I, you know what? I I could see why you'd say that, but the only reason why I believe it's an April Fool's joke is because they in some of the pr- trailers for the upcoming season they have shown her as part of the Battle of Winterfell, which is episode three. Well, I hope you're right on that one. But I remember very vaguely, I remember reading something, God, it's got to be at least two or three years by now. Like, you know how a lot of stuff leaked uh, before the last season had aired, like different plot scenarios and things like that. And I seem to remember in one of them, Ari dying very early in the last season. 
Yeah, I think she uh, she did. Yeah. So I really hope I'm wrong on that because I love Ari Starch, one of my favorite characters on the show. She played that off perfectly, though, if it was just an April Fool's joke because she's a great actress. I'll tell you that. Oh, Mike, she nailed that moment. And I, like I said, Dude, she had yeah, like tears. I, I got she had tears in her in. I mean, eyes. she looked like she was going to cry. She barely yeah. could talk. And we cut that out. Oh, no, they're going to tweet it. Oh, she freaking nailed it. There, there's no question about it. She, she exemplified her acting skills. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't even really know where to go from that one. Um, but, uh, well, really yeah. quick, if you want to go Game of Thrones, did you see the little teaser trailer they dropped today? It's only like a minute long, but they did a little teaser trailer. that For Game, was, for Game of Thrones? Yeah. It, no, it, not a single character is shown in the trailer. Uh, but okay. do yourself a favor. It, just watch it. If you hop, I mean, I don't know if you log into Twitter that often anymore. Um, but you can go on YouTube, whatever. It's a quick little one-minute uh, teaser trailer uh, that just came out this morning. Um, and speaking of teaser trailers, because, uh, I mean, we definitely are right on that window to wrap up. So I want to make yeah, sure yeah. I can ask you as well. Did you see the teaser trailer that released today for Avengers Endgame to announce the release of pre-sale tickets? I did. I did. And I loved the trailer. I have some thoughts on that. I want to hear your thoughts first and see if maybe we're simpatico on this. What did you think of the trailer? All right, well, first and foremost, when I was done watching it, I felt like I realized it was December 2nd, and Chris and I was a 10-year-old kid, and, <laughs> Christmas, and Christmas is only two and a half weeks away. Yeah. So that was my first feeling after watching the trailer. Mm. Um, now, what I will say was I was disappointed in how much they, they showed you with Tony Stark being back on Earth. That's exactly where I was going with that, yes. Because, yeah, I was di- disappointed in that to have him see him hug pepper Potts, and it's like pepper is in new york yeah it was too much of a giveaway to his return Mm -hmm. that i really that part i didn't like um and i also think that if you paid close attention to the uniform that captain america is wearing when tony stark asks him do you trust me i think it's a clear giveaway that they're back in the battle of new york in the original avengers movie yeah, I mean, I kind of everything I've heard makes it sound like there was going to be time travel. They've been saying that for about a year, so that I'm not I'm not entirely surprised by. But yes, after I watched the trailer, my immediate reaction was, "God, I kind of wish I hadn't watched this trailer," because yeah, and listen, I think we all kind of assumed Tony was coming back to Earth. I think we all assumed. He was getting back at the original Avengers. We all assumed he was going to meet up with Pepper. We all assumed he was going to meet up with Cap. We all assumed they were going to battle Thanos. Did we really need to see all this stuff? Did we need to know that Pepper survived the snap two and a half weeks or three and a half, however long it's going to be before the movie comes out? That was my initial thought. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. Love the trailer. Still yeah. hyped for the movie. Oh, yeah. You've already gotten enough Avengers trailers that that have shown things that aren't in the movies. So, I mean, who knows what we've watched in the three trailers they've given you of what's in there and what's not in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, Thanos' line in that in that clip was badass where he's just like, even when you're failing, like, your path still brings you back to me or something along those lines. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The worst yeah. Word, but yeah, I'm such a badass it. clip. And I mean, uh, look, it, I can't freaking wait for that movie. And dude, websites were literally crashing. Oh, the pre sale ones? Yeah, with, yeah, yeah. With people trying to go in and do pre sale purchases. Yeah. Literally crashing. My friends, when I was at work, an hour and 40 minutes until he was able to get his tickets. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds about right. Yeah. I didn't even, I didn't even, I don't know about you. I didn't even try buying the pre-sale because there's just no point to it right now. But, no, I, I, I was talking, I was talking with somebody about it. And I'm like, look, wait till tomorrow because the, the initial mad rush is today. 
So mm-hmm. wait for tomorrow, and then you'll be able to get them. You might not be able to get them, on, you know, as early as you'd like to get them, but you'll still be able to get them. Mm-hmm. So here, here's the question, because you look at what Avengers Infinity War did box office-wise last year, and you look at what Black Panther did before that, because Black Panther is actually, I think, the highest grossing open, um no, excuse me, I'm wrong. It's the highest grossing American uh, domestic box office total of all time. And I think Avengers has the opening weekend total. I think it cracked like 250 or something like that. Captain Marvel has now almost passed a billion dollars worldwide. Do you think Avengers and Endgame can crack a billion dollars on opening weekend worldwide? Um, world, worldwide, yeah. I, th- I think every show, every movie theater has is going to be sold out the entire opening weekend. Mm, another question. And, and, I, and that's not just in, all, in the new, you know, tri-state area. I think that's countrywide, worldwide. I mean, it, it, is, it is literally the culmination of almost 11 years and 23, 24 movies. This is going to be the 22nd, actually. Uh, Endgame is the 22nd. All right, so 20, we'll just say 20, 20 plus movies. You know, I mean, it, this is something that literally people have been waiting for since 2008 when Iron Man came out, but you didn't know this is what it was coming to really, you know, since the first Avengers movie when you just see Thanos smile mm. in the extra credit scene. Yeah. You don't, I mean, when I first watched that scene, I literally didn't even know who it was. I had to start searching to find out who Thanos was because I didn't read comic books. I was only, I only got into it from the movies. So, I mean, it, it, it brought it, it opened my life to a completely different world and uh, um, I can't wait for it. And I, I think it's going to be an amazing, amazing movie. And I'll tell you now, I won't drink a single thing that entire day before I go. And I will <laughs> go to the bathroom as many times as I can make myself before I walk in that theater, because I will not want to miss a single second of that movie. Yeah, three hours, man. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. I don't care about the three-hour long time. You know, if it's done right, you ain't even going to feel like it was three hours. So there was that. Um, I'm not going to lie. I kind of knew who Thanos was, but I had to look it up on Wikipedia just to be sure. Because I didn't read Avengers comics when I was a kid, but I had... They had comic cards, like baseball cards, when I was a kid. So I had, I knew who Thanos was just off of that. And I had heard of the Infinity War storyline. Never read it. Never read it. So, but I knew of it. So once I knew who is, – is that Thanos? Yes, that's Thanos. I knew where they were going. At. So that, that's cool. Um, now, here's the last question. The highest grossing worldwide movie of all time is Avatar. I think it's got close to 22, 2.1 billion, I think it's got. Uh, Avatar's highest grossing, followed by Titanic, uh, Force Awakens, Star Wars, and Avengers Infinity War. Anyway, this movie doesn't break Avatar and be the highest grossing worldwide movie of all time. I think before it comes out of theaters, it could literally double Avatar. Mm. Yeah. Uh, double? Oof. Yeah. That's pretty big. That's pretty big. I I don't think it'll double it just because when the summer movie season really gets into full gear and you think about this movie comes out the last week in April, May, there winds up being like a blockbuster movie coming out every week. I think this movie can hit three billion, no question. I don't know about doubling though. That's that's gonna be tough. I'm calling. I, I'm I, I'm calling it because I figure at least twenty five percent of the people that go see this movie are going to go see it at least one more time. Yeah, no, I'm definitely going to probably see it at least twice. I saw Infinity War a whole bunch of times in the theaters. So I could definitely see that. But uh, yeah, I'm go- I'm going to say two. So you got four point two billion, and I'm going to say three billion, and we will revisit this in a few months and see who was right, or at least who was closest. Sounds like a game plan, my brother. (laughs) All right, Dave. I think that's going to do it here for us tonight. So, Dave Hastings, thank you for joining me tonight. This was a fun show. I enjoyed this one. Do you have any last words? 
always a pleasure, my man. And until next week. All right. Once again, thank you, Dave. I am Mike Aguilera. Next week, we get to hear some honeymoon stories from Eric Tressler as he returns. Thank you all for listening. And we will see you all next week.